So I think we can start now. So I have a little throat today. So if uh, if my voice is not clear, please please let let me know. I will try to repeat. Now before we uh, start the lecture, uh, let's go through like some of the administrative details. Now uh, I wanted to talk about the course project because uh, some of you have questions about the expectations and uh, about the about the project itself. So the first deadline for submitting the uh, the proposal, like uh, the description about which project you are choosing, that was 27th. And I was just checking before the class. Uh, most of you have submitted, so that's good. And uh, we will do the evaluation. And if we have any question, or if you want to like modify some of the aspects uh, of your project, we will let you know. And uh, some of you have uh, not submitted the description. If you are one of them, please uh, do that as soon as possible. And if you have any questions, you need any help, uh, please let me know. So <clears throat> that was about the uh, description. Then regarding uh, what we expect from the course project. So deliverables, uh, I think this year, we just want the code which you have written for the project and a detailed report about the project okay so the code should be well commented and it should be modular so don't make it like just one function and everything is there so it will be very hard to understand so try to use different functions for different uh, functionalities uh, try to use comments so that it's uh, readable that, uh, that's for the code uh, then the report uh, this uh, should be the format first try to describe the problem what exactly you are trying to solve maybe in one or two paragraphs okay uh, then followed by that you should describe uh, how you are solving that problem what is your approach all right so this will include uh, <clears throat> in data processing you do uh, details of like uh, what resolution or if it's a video how many frames all those informations and then what kind of architecture you're using and details of the architecture. So I think if you put the uh, figure for the architecture, that will be the best showing like how many layers it has and how many kernels, kernel size. So all the all the technical details uh, should be there. And then followed by the loss function, which you're going to use, talk about that. So that will be the approach. And then uh, try to write about how exactly you are evaluating your method. For example, if it's classification, then you might be just showing the accuracy scores, okay? And if you're doing detection, then you might be showing the mean average precision. Uh, and so similarly, like depending upon your project, you will have different evaluation metrics. Talk about that, how you are doing the evaluation, then talk, talk about the data set, which data set you're using, what are the details of that data set, like what kind of images, what's the resolution, how many images, how many classes, Okay, and then follow, uh, followed by that, you will show the results. And again, this will vary from project to project. So in the results, I think it's good to include uh, visuals like uh, the, the training details, uh, how well the loss was converging, how the accuracy was changing with the, with the training. And then if you have multiple classes, show like if uh, the performance is same for all the classes of its, or, or if it's different. And then if it's detection, you can also show some visual samples, right? So what kind of detection your network predicted, the bonding boxes or uh, the localization region. So try to include that. And the final part is discussion and analysis. I think this is the most important part. Okay, so this is, uh, <clears throat> this is something which is important because the results, we don't expect you to like give a very good performance, right? So we're not after that. In, if you have reasonable performance, that's fine. It's not, it should not be like your method is not working at all. It's not training at all. So it should be training. You should have some, you, you should have some results. I think, uh, just give me. So can you, can you hear me? Okay, all right, good. Yes, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for confirming. 
so somehow that uh, heads died uh, okay so yeah i was talking about uh, discussion yeah this is the most important part and this is where like even if you're not getting good results uh, you're having problem in training your network so then this is the portion where you can show like okay what effort you put in okay so what different variations you tried which didn't work out so then it should not be like okay you have designed a network you try to train it didn't work that's it so that's like something which you, which you tried but it's not like sufficient effort right so then it should talk about okay if it didn't work then what was the what was the reason then how you tried to fix it so all the steps you took so you can put everything uh, in the discussion analysis section and if you're getting good results then you can try to analyze those results for example like if uh, it's a classification problem you can talk about for which classes it's not performing well and for which classes it's performing well and for example it could be like you have a data imbalance in your uh, data set you have more samples for one classes less samples for the classes and if you're seeing that it's performing good uh, on the class where you have more samples so things like like that so provide more insights okay and there will be i think cases uh, some problems where uh, you won't have any evaluation metric it will be difficult to the to the evaluation because you won't have the ground truth so for those scenarios uh, it will be good if you provide some kind of a demo so demo could be something like you can just provide the readme file run this command and then you can see the results okay for example i think there is a project or uh, someone is doing uh, detecting edges in a video so for that we don't have like any benchmark data set which uh, you can use and where we have the ground truth and you can evaluate like how good the edges are so for those kind of projects i think a good demo will be you write a simple script and which we can run and then it can show the video and all the detected edges like uh, on on every frame and that can be like played as a video so you can save that video as well and share that uh, share, save video with us. We can just watch the video and we can just run your command and be able to reproduce that, that video. Okay. So again, this will be different for different projects, but don't worry if you don't have evaluation metric, you can just show us the demo, whether your method is working or not. Now, <clears throat> I think there were some questions. Let me quickly go over those. Uh, A question from uh, Kasun. Can it be combined with another subject? Uh, so Kasun, can you clarify that? What can be combined with uh, what another subject? Uh, for the project, Professor, I was thinking about like uh, stopping, uh, like uh, let's say like uh, there is a volcanic explosion and the lava flows. So uh, like in vision, like we identify the, you know, the corners and we design a uh, like, uh, uh, like a way to stop it with mathematical modeling. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking to combine mathematical modeling for that part. So how to stop the lava, like, you know, getting external uh, sources or as like a natural disaster, like a wildfire. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, that is fine. You can combine it with something else, but you should have some component of uh, computer vision. As long as you have that, uh, I think it's perfectly fine. You can include whatever else you want. So the vision, uh, like it helps us to uh, identify this, uh, the moving uh, points. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, the, so, and the stationary points. So for an example, if it is a wildfire, you know, we can identify uh, like the, the moving areas and stationary areas. Based on that, like we build the model. Right, yeah, that's fine. So as long as you have that component, which is where you have some algorithm or some network, some function which takes the visual data, do some processing. So that will be your project, right? And then it will give some output. So what are you doing with that output? That's perfectly fine. You can include like outside knowledge. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. So question from uh, Stephanie, how long should the report be? And are you expecting a specific format for the report? Uh, so yeah, I think I will, I will share one uh, draft with you, which you can you can use. And it's in, in LaTeX, but I think your doc file should also be there. So probably it will be good if you just follow that uh, format. So I think that's a good comment, Stephanie. We will do that. 
and how long so it should be anywhere from like uh, four pages to six pages that's perfectly fine and even like three and a half pages that's also fine so it should not be like too short and too long i mean too long it's fine we will manage that so don't worry if you have too many results but it should, it should not be like too short okay so roughly like at least four pages okay so then yeah i think my last question from sayed can we use pytorch yolo for the project also is it okay if we use pre-trained yolo i was thinking about making a system to extract pedestrian trajectory from videos <clears throat> yeah say so that's that's perfectly fine because object detection is not not your project right it's just part of it so if you are basing your project on object detection it's perfectly fine to use pre-trained yolo but just mention that which part you are using like from an existing source code and which part is like which you have developed so for your project for example it's like uh extracting the pedestrian trajectory right so that's your that's your contribution so using like you know i think it will be fine okay okay so any any other question about the course project any doubt you have like uh regarding the expectations maybe any other question about the code about the report we can we can cover it now because it's it's almost end of October and uh, I know like most of you have started uh, working on it. Uh, that's really good. But if you have not, uh, please start working on it so that if you have questions, if you are facing any issue, you can come to us and we will be able to help you. And but if you like come to us like maybe end of November, then that will be busy time for us as well, right? So then there will be some lag between like when you when you contact us and when we are responding. So that will uh, that will uh, not be a good idea. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Fernando: Where is it due? So it will be due uh, the end of semester, I think, 9th of December. So the latest which we can do. So we want to provide you like all the time which which we can provide. Question from Matthias: My teammate submitted, but I had forgotten to submit yeah i think you should still be able to submit it and if it's not giving you an option just let me know i, I will try to fix it so all the students who have not submitted please do that uh, as soon as possible and if you don't know what project you want to do again contact us we'll assign assign you one project okay uh i missed the deadline last night yeah you can still submit it uh, that's fine So I think those were uh, all the questions. But if, if you still have question and you don't know how to ask right now, don't worry. Uh, just write me an email later, and uh, I, I will respond. Okay. Uh, question from C. Yeah, of course you can do like as an indi individual project. That's perfectly fine. So you can you can do do it individually. You can. You can have group of group, groups of two, three, four, and maximum will be five students. And that's why we need you to submit that proposal because if we see that in a project there are five students, we want to make sure that uh, there is like some component in the project for all the students. So we don't want to give like free rights to students who are in the group but are not doing anything. So that's not fair. Okay, but if you are doing independently, then the scope will be limited. So that you can finish it in time. Okay. Question from Shibu: When will the PA two assignment release? Uh, we will release it in in a week's time. So let me see. It's twenty eighth, right? And you will have roughly two weeks for that. So we want you to finish by like the twentieth of November. So you can say like first week of uh, first week of November. Okay. Because then after 20th, you may be busy in preparing for the end sem. So you we don't want you to like interrupt at that time. So probably first week of November, and then you will have two weeks to finish it. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah, sure. We are we are working on it. Uh, we'll release like as soon as possible. Some grading is still remaining. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> uh, till now we have been focusing on feature extraction. All right. So now you now you know how to extract features using some classical algorithms, which are like uh, we call them handcrafted features like HOG and SIFT. And uh, I think there's one more question. Bonus assignment. Yeah, so I haven't decided yet. So I'm still waiting on uh, the programming assignment first and midterm grades. And then depending upon the curve uh, we get, we will, we will release it. Okay. And bonus assignment, I think there will be some overlap with the, with the second programming assignment. I think which should be fine because it's bonus. So if you're going to do it, that uh, that should be like an extra effort from your end. So if we release that, we'll release it before the second programming assignment. Uh, I think it's good you ask that, okay? Probably, let me, just, just give me one minute. I can actually do a quick poll about that. So taking your feedback will be very useful. Okay, you can just let me know like whether you would like, like to have a bonus programming assignment or not. Question from Alkasun, can we get bonus assignment other than programming? Uh, no, Kasun, so only the programming assignment will be the bonus one. And then we have extra like a pop quizzes right in the class. So that's that's also bonus. It's not like from the from the total grades. So question from Fernando, why would we vote no? I don't know. I mean, some, some students have voted no, right? <laughs> Probably they are already uh, getting good grades, so they don't want to do extra work. Uh, question from Curtis, would it be mandatory? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's not mandatory, totally up to you. And it's just extra credit. If you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't want to do it, that's also fine. Okay. All right, so it seems like most of you want it. So then uh, I think, uh, let me release that. Uh, by early next week. And then again, you will get like roughly two weeks for that. Okay, question from Shivani. If we get good grades in the first two PA, will the grades of bonus PA will still be counted? Yeah, they will still be counted. I mean, as long as you are not scoring full marks, they will all, always be counted. Okay, but was that your question, Shivani? I mean, it, it won't be something like uh, we, will, we will pick from either, uh, it's not like uh, picking two out of three. So whatever scores you get like from the bonus, that will be added on your programming assignment scores. Okay. I hope that answered your question. If not, uh, please, please let me know. Yeah, so what I'm saying is the bonus programming assignment, that's like, if you're doing it, you will definitely get points for it. So it's not like uh, we'll pick from uh, like, so you, so in total, you will have three programming assignments. Like so it won't be like picking uh, two out of three, all three will be counted. Yeah, Shivani, it will be capped at 20 points. So if you're getting full marks in programming assignment one and programming assignment two, then you don't need to do bonus. 
unless you want to do for practice. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. That's how it will work. Okay. So yeah, uh, early early next week, uh, Shane. That will be the bonus, and after that, we will give you programming assignment too. So bonus programming assignment cannot be made up for midterm grade. No, but uh, I mean that's hard to say. I mean you can, if you are not doing well on programming assignments, then still you are making up your grade, right? So it's not a replacement for a midterm. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, if you have questions, that's good. You're asking. There was a question from Sayed, including in the final exam. That we have covered a lot, Sayed. So I don't know why you're asking that. So all the topics which we will cover after the midterm, that will be included in the final exam. OK, so I think uh, let's let's continue the, the lecture. After the midterm, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, so we have uh, we have discussed uh, how to extract features using deep learning, and we have seen how to extract features using classical methods. Now, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, classification. And classification is something like if you if you are using uh, a classical approach to extract features, so then you will you will need those features to perform classification. But if you're using like some kind of end-to-end -end network, uh, for example, your neural network, which is completely trainable, then you don't have to use the uh, extracted features because your network is going to extract the features for you, right? So we'll try to cover both aspects where, uh, first we'll talk about where you use the pre-extracted uh, pre features, the classical approaches uh, for classification. And then later we'll talk about like the end-to-end -end approach uh, where you don't have to extract features. So this is in a way, in a way like you have also covered in your first programming assignment, but we'll try to cover like some of the topics which were uh, not there, okay? Uh, so classification, I think the basic idea, we have dis uh, discussed this earlier as well. The idea is you will have certain set of classes. In, in this case, I'm showing you two different classes, right? Uh, the first class is uh, the blue dots and the second class is the orange dots. In this case, uh, I'm, I'm showing you the, the samples as 2D coordinate points. So consider this as a Cartesian space and each location will have like some X and some Y value, the coordinate value, right? So based on that value, we, have, we are just plotting that, uh, that sample into the Cartesian space. And then visually we can see that the blue dots are like around this region, which means that the the X value of uh, the samples coming from blue will have a uh, less value as compared to the samples coming from the uh, the orange class. And again, the Y value be, uh, will, will also be like greater than the Y value in this one, but it's not just like X and Y value, it's a combination of both. That will make the blue dots lie at this region. And this, this is like the orange region. So what we can do is if you want to do a classification task, we need a function which can actually differentiate between these two classes. So that function can be as simple as a straight line, something like this. And this straight line will have some function, all right? So it will require two parameters. And once you have that equation, then what you can do is any point in this Cartesian space, you can, you can put that sample x, y value in the, in the equation of this line and you will get some number which will be either positive, either negative. And depending upon like where it lies, so this might have a positive value and this might have a negative value. And based on that sign, you can say that, okay, which class this point belongs to. For example, if I put like these blue points, so all these blue points will give you, let's say positive number. So any number, let's say at this location as well, which is not like in one of these blue dots, but again on the left side of the line, if I put that point on this line, it will give you a negative value. Similarly, like orange, it will give you the other sign, which means that you can use this line to classify any testing sample, which is not actually present in, in this particular case. So that's uh, that will act as a classifier. So classification, like, 
it, it can have different 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 flavors and i think some of this uh, you will be doing for your course project as well if you're doing multi-level classification and we have these examples like mnist uh, all these data sets are for digits so mnist in one image we have one particular digit starting from zero to nine so the problem is given an image the function will have to tell you which digit is present in that image so that's classification so multi mnist is again it's a it's a data set of images but there could be like multiple digits present in that image and again svhn is a this is, uh, I think, house numbers, street view house numbers. So that's the abbreviation. And again, you can have multiple digits uh, in, in that image. But again, at the end, you'll have to classify like which digits are present. Okay, something like this. So these are the images uh, from uh, ImageNet. Similarly, so that was digit classification. Similarly, you can have object classification. All right. And again, we have these different data sets, uh, Cypher 10, Cypher 100, and ImageNet. So in these images, we will have these objects. So again, uh, it's just like a, a variation, but at the end, like both are in both cases, we are just doing classification. So you could essentially use the same network. So I think there's a question, question from Fernando, how would the output layer look for multi MNIST? So output layer again, uh, MNIST, you have 10 different, uh, 10 different digits, right? So your output uh, layer should predict that 10 different values, one value for each for each digit. So the difference between multi MNIST and MNIST will be, in case of MNIST, you will still have 10 values, but only one of the values will be active, right? Uh, whereas in the case of multi MNIST, multiple values can be active depending upon how many digits you have. Okay, so for example, if it's person classification, I think we have seen the, these images before. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, uh, simple idea, given an image, you just have to say whether a person is present or not. Similarly, if it's not, you will just say no. So it's a binary classification problem. And <clears throat> the, the, the biggest data set we have for uh, image classification is ImageNet where we have uh, roughly thousand classes. So these are uh, objects like from uh, from day to day life, and then uh, we have around one point two million images. I think it's it's much more than that. Right now we have fourteen million. It's it's grown a lot, and so the initial set had one point two million images and hundred samples, and this is how we evaluate like any algorithm. So this is like top of five error. What we do is we take like the top five predictions of the network, and then we see okay whether in the top five list the actual object is present or not so let me quickly go over like uh, this is just a review we have covered this earlier as well the way we do uh, classification is we have a data set all right so data set is like all the samples which we can use for training or which you can use for maybe building a classifier so it's a classical approach and we divide that into training validation and testing this we all know and uh, the training images we use like uh, for feature extraction and then training our networks. And this is done using the labels, the, the actual annotations we have for each image. Okay, and once we have the train uh, classifier, we use that uh, to actually extract features from the testing images and then make predictions. So that's like the general, general idea about how the uh, classification pipeline works. Now, in terms of features, if you want to use classical algorithms, you can have uh, these set of features. Okay, some of these you already know how to extract. We have, uh, so these are fine histograms, raw pixels, but we have also discussed uh, SIFT and HOG, just as almost uh, similar to SIFT with some uh, variations. And in case of uh, deep learning, you don't have to actually extract features, you directly send in your images. But whatever you do, you, you can always define your classifier as a function f. And the idea is you give your sample to your function and that function will make predictions which uh, class is present uh, in that image. Okay. So again, I'm going to skip these slides because we have uh, already talked about this. Okay, so how you predict and... Okay, so now this is interesting. So uh, bear with me here. 
this is uh, going to be useful like when we talk about uh, the basic classifiers like max, max margin and SVM. So try to understand this. And again, this is like something we have uh, two classes, the red crosses and uh, the yellow circles. What we want to do is we want to develop a classifier and this is just two classes. So we can say that it's a binary classification problem. We have to say that uh, either this object is present or this object is present. And this is called linear classifier because what we are doing is the diffusion boundary we have, it's a straight line. All right, and for the straight line, we just need the equation for the straight line. And once we have that, we can easily use that uh, equation. We call that linear classifier. Uh, given a testing sample, we will be able to say that which particular class is present in that sample or not. So let's start with like the basic uh, classifier. It's called nearest neighbor, and it's it's very uh, simple to implement. I think uh, we might give you this classifier for the bonus programming assignment. Okay, so the idea here is you have, let's say two classes. These are the blue uh, square boxes, and then you have red circles. So these are your training examples, okay? Now in nearest neighbor, you don't perform any training. So basically you're not actually learning any, any, any boundary, decision boundary. So depending upon your testing sample, you will you will uh, you will draw your boundary on the fly. Okay, so let's see how this works. So all these uh, solid uh, solid uh, points are the training samples, and these uh, this is the first testing sample. Right now we don't know, and again this is shown on a Cartesian like two uh, two dimensional space, but you can easily generalize this to high dimensional space as well. It would be three D, four D, or N D. Okay, the concept is uh, concept is not going to change. So this is your testing sample. Now what we do is we compute the distance of this testing sample with all the training samples. All right. For example, we compute the distance with this sample. We compute the distance with this sample and possibly all the samples. All right, and then we simply try to figure out which is the closest sample. So in this case, this will be the closest sample. So we are just computing Euclidean distance. And then what we do is we say that, okay, the nearest sample is blue. Then this testing sample belongs to the blue class. It's, it's as simple as that. So you, you can see that if you take a testing sample from this location, then it's more likely that it will be closer to the red samples. So as long as the testing sample is this uh, vicinity, you will have no trouble. And again, if the testing sample is uh, around this uh, location, perfectly fine. But the challenging scenario will be, we don't know what will happen if the testing sample is at, uh, at the center of these two classes, so somewhere, let's say here. So again, then we will look at like the nearest samples. So whichever of these two is the nearest sample, we just assign that class. So then you can think about like how the decision boundary will look like. So it will be a line like which is equidistant from these two points, right? Okay, question from uh, Mud. In the slide with blue and red dots, what are the X and Y axis? What does the space imply? Red and blue, probably you're talking about slide number 21. So X and Y axis are just the two dimensions of, of, your, of your features. So right now we are assuming that our feature space is just two dimension. So it's just X could be like the X axis and Y could be the Y axis. And again, you can generalize this to N dimensional space if your feature vector has N different values. So it, again, it will have N different uh, dimensions. Yeah, it's, it's simply a space. I mean, how does it matter like whether it's in meters or centimeters? It could be centimeters, it could be millimeters, it could be nanometers. I mean, okay, I thought it could be something totally different than distance. You mean like how we are computing the distance between two points? So 
Sorry, but I didn't, I didn't get your question. Okay, good, good. So, uh, okay, so that's, uh, <clears throat> I think another question from Shah. The more the number of training samples, the more distance calculation the algorithm, the algorithm will do. Yeah, that's true, Shah. That's a good point. So the, the, the bigger your data set is, the more calculations will have to, you will have to do. And of course, when you can do some optimization, but let's not go there. The, the bottom line is we'll have to do more calculations. All right. So <clears throat> then we compute the distance. We saw that this is the closest one. So we just assign this one as a blue class. Okay, so the all, uh, we just need a distance function and no training is required. So we have a pop quiz. Uh, I think it's just based on we just discussed. And uh, the question is on nearest nearest neighbor. Again, we have the same set of uh, training samples. We have two classes. Yeah, we will we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll come to key nearest neighbor. Okay, right now we are just talking about nearest neighbor. Okay, so, so these are your training samples. Uh, the blue ones are like class number one, the red ones are class number two. And what you want to do is you want to uh, perform classification. And if there is classification, then there has to be like a decision boundary, right? So the question is like, what will be the decision boundary uh, for such a training data? So I'm giving you some options. So A is like a straight line like this or a straight line, which is like more inclined towards the blue on the top. And then C is like a curve. And then the fourth option is like none of these three. Yeah, only only one of the answer is true, Sayed. All of them cannot be true at the same time because they are they are contradicting each other, right? Uh, yeah, some of you are saying all three will be fine, but think about it. How can all three will be three can be fine? You can only have you can only have one decision boundary, right? So once you have the decision boundary, that should be able to tell you like which samples on the left like belong to which class, and which samples on the right belongs to one class. If you have multiple boundaries, then they will contradict with each other, and that that that's not true. So only one of the option is correct. So there's a question from uh, Momal, why, why is it called k nearest? So as I said, Momal, we, we're not talking about k nearest yet. Uh, we'll come to that. Right now, we're just talking about nearest neighbor. You can change your answer if you want, that's fine. We'll just consider the last answer you get. Professor, yeah. uh, can you please uh, repeat the question again, please? The question. Someone is, okay. So this is your training data, right? Uh, blue samples, red samples, and you have to <clears throat> perform classification using nearest neighbor. The question is, what will be the decision boundary on such a training data? So decision boundary means like it should, it should tell you like, uh, given a testing sample, which class that sample belongs to. OK, 
okay so i think that's that's enough time so if you, if you think about this uh the first one is definitely not uh, correct because a point on the left of this line I mean that will be closer to the red one right so why will you classify that as a blue one so that's definitely not right if you look at the b one the second one then again if you take a testing point at this location so that's actually closer to the blue point as compared to the red one so this also doesn't look right and c seems okay but i think uh, if you think carefully this is this is also not right because given two points if you have to just draw a draw a line which is equidistant from two points it's it's never a curve it's always a straight line okay so the answer was uh, none of these and okay question from Momal, explain uh, why not A. So if A is the decision boundary, if you pick, so can you see my, uh, this laser pointer? Okay, so the location where I have like put the laser pointer, so this point is closer to the red dot, right? But if I use this decision boundary, it will say that it's, uh, it's, it's it belongs to the blue color, which is wrong. Therefore, this is not true. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think a comment from Tristan. C really seemed like the middle point for each position. Yeah, that's how I plotted that. So it it looks like. But again, as I said, if if you think about this, two points in space, and you have to draw a boundary which is like equidistant from these points that line is always going to be a straight line it, it will never be a curve because if it's a curve then it means that if you move away it's going to favor one of the point it's it's getting closer to one of the point which is not true right it should always be a straight line so that's why it's not it's not correct okay a uh, question from moment we are using a support factor based approach it is hard to tell that from visualization yeah we are not still talking about support vector moment you're going too fast first you're talking about key nearest neighbor we are still talking about nearest neighbor then you're talking about support vector so please hold on we will we'll go there actually professor i thought that uh, we are actually looking for the points which which are closer like we are taking the test points near the boundary and then we are trying to compute the distance from data points of either class and this is something similar to support vectors no in which yeah, it is it is support vector is actually based on this idea so yeah we will go there so okay right thank you okay uh, still not clear about a so moment you are still not clear about a or is, is that fine no i i'm not i didn't ask that oh, Mo, oh sorry yeah mozen uh Okay, so Mozam, you can see my uh, red, uh, this laser pointer, right? And if you compute the distance of this point with the red dot, this one, and this is the nearest one, right? All the others are far away, so we can easily ignore all those. So these two are the nearest. So this point is actually close to red, so it should be classified as red. But if you use this decision boundary, it's this point is on the left, which means that it will be a blue class, which is not correct. Okay, I hope that's clear now. Uh, question from Carlos, is the test sample point is in the middle? Okay, if the test sample point is in the middle, same distance from red and blue, how do we classify it? Yeah, then it's a tie. And that's a good question. So <clears throat> we'll come to that. It's a tie. Uh, okay, it's all based on distance. That's true. Yeah, yeah. She will, will come. We are coming to that. Let me finish all the questions. Okay, the decision boundary will always be a straight line. So, say it. Uh, it will be a straight line if you are only considering two points. 
but as soon as a third point comes into play then there will be like some shift in that line okay because then you don't have to compute distance between two points it will be distance between three points okay question from shaya i'm coming to that the correct decision boundary okay question from james wouldn't a curve boundary be more accurate than a straight line or could that leading to overfitting uh james it's it's not about overfitting okay let me actually quickly go through let me share my screen so can you see my uh sketchboard okay so let's say this is your uh first point this is your second point now this is the midpoint right now if i draw a straight line like this so this is the correct decision boundary all the points on the left will be close uh, closer to this one and all the points on the right will be closer to this one so it has to be straight line if it's a curve which means that it will be something like this or it could be something like this right any curve but if you think about this as you move away from this point then if you are creating a curve then the direction where the curve is actually lending you are actually favoring this class which is not true because at this location if you compute the distance this point is closer to x but if you use a curve this is going to be classified as this point which is not right that's why if there are only two points it will always have to be a straight line okay and if there is like a third point then we will come to that so i hope that was uh uh clear so james that was fine right so now so d was the right answer and let's see like uh why uh, it looks like that so to understand that uh, let's try to understand the uh, uh warnai boundaries and this is like uh, the decision boundary how it will look like so we have the blue we have the black dots as one class and the red dots at uh, as another class all right so this is like more complicated example than the previous one which i showed in the question so here you can see that let's try to focus on these two points as i said it will always be a straight line right but as soon as there is a third point into into picture for example this one then beyond this if you draw a straight line the distance will be closer to this one so we'll have to ignore either of these two so then we'll have to split it so we'll have to draw another line between these two and another line between these two okay so what we are doing is we're always creating a decision boundary between two points and as soon as there is a third point uh, which is coming to uh, play we'll split our, split our decision boundary and this is called like a warnai boundary and uh, on the left like this is a uh, how it will look, look like in 2d space and you can extend this or generalize this easily to an n dimensional space on the right uh, i'm showing this for a 3d uh, a 3d plot okay so in this case it will be like uh, lines but if it's 3d space uh, your decision boundary will be surfaces and again if it's an n dimensional space your decision boundary will be hyperplanes Okay, so now now going going back to this one, your decision boundary will be something like uh, a straight line coming from here, and then maybe you will have a straight line like this, then again a straight line there and a straight line there. So it will be a zigzag kind of boundary. Okay, so that was a uh, nearest neighbor, and I think there was a question from Omar like. Uh, about k nearest neighbor and there was a question about what if like it's equidistant from two points so to resolve that what we we we'd, uh, actually do is we'll have k nearest neighbor right so instead of just considering one uh, nearest neighbor we will consider k different samples and let's say this is your uh, these are your training samples green and red ones and uh, the plus sign which is marked uh, using black are your testing samples then we have to classify them using let's say k nearest neighbor i will show you like all the variations 
So if it's one nearest neighbor, you can see the red one is the closest. So this will be classified as red and this will be classified as uh, green. Now, if you, if you think about this, if this is your actual training data, which is coming from real world, where we can have some kind of noise and some of the samples can be outliers, okay? So if, if I try to visually inspect this, it seems like all the samples like in this particular area should be like the red class and all the samples like below this area should be the green class. So if I look at this point, this cross here, this seems like closer to the red one. So it should have been classified as red, but it was classified as green. And this plus dot seems like towards the green, so it should have been classified as green. It's just like the red one is the nearest, therefore it was classified as red. So now if you look at the three nearest uh, solution, then the situation is different. Because in this case, these two greens are actually uh, the next closest to this one. So the first nearest was red, then the second was green, the third was green, and then you will pick like the best two out of three. And this is like green. So you mark that as green. And again, this one you will see like, uh, this is the nearest, then the second nearest, and possibly the third nearest. So again, this is classified as green. Now, if you go further, it can be like five nearest. So instead of three, you can look at like the top five. And again, you can choose like best three out of uh, best, uh, best uh, of the top five and you can classify accordingly, okay? So one question I have for you is like, why it's like one nearest three and five? Why don't we do like two nearest or four nearest? So can you answer that? Right, if it's two nearest, then if it's a tie, then we don't know what's the solution. Therefore, we always pick like a, an, an odd number, okay? there will never be a tie. So I hope that answered the question uh, from Momal about K nearest and uh, I think from James, so I don't remember who asked that. Okay, so the simple algorithm uh, for this K nearest uh, classification will be, you first extract features from the training samples. And again, these features would be your Maybe coming from autoencoders, and these could be your SIP features, HOG features. Then you extract the same set of features for the testing samples. And then for each testing sample, you will compute the distance from all the training samples. And then you just uh, sort those distances. And depending upon whether it's one nearest or two nearest, you will make a decision. So it's a very simple algorithm. If you have any question, please let me know because I think you will have to implement this for uh, the bonus programming assignment. Okay, so the good good things mean you might have seen that it's very simple and easy to implement, easy to understand, very intuitive. And the good mean you don't need any training. You just have the training sample and just make the decision on the fly. And it can be used for classification and regression and different kind of search, uh, search problems. The issue is, uh, as I think Shah was uh, pointing out, if you have large number of samples, it will be very slow. For example, if you have 1 billion samples, then you will have to compute distance from all those 1 billion points, which is not efficient. All right, so that's uh, one of the drawback. And the other drawback is if your feature vector is let's say high dimensional, it has a lot of values, then computing the distance from between two points will take a lot of time. So again, it can be very slow. So that was again, uh, a very, very basic classifier. Uh, but I think the idea will remain same, how we distinguish between different points and how we classify them. Now, let, let's move on to linear classifier. Okay, so again, we have the same uh, set of uh, training samples here. Uh, question from a uh, moment, what if the test sample is an anomaly? Yeah, if it's an anomaly, mean we can't help it, right? It's an anomaly, that's it. So at least for nearest neighbor, we, we can't help it. So it will be just misclassified. Okay. Even like mean, even for the advanced algorithms, if your if your test sample is an anomaly, then I don't think any network can do anything about it. So even humans mean even as humans, if you think if we if we try to analyze, we will fail because 
let's consider the simple consider this uh, simple scenario right uh, <clears throat> blue blue color on the left red color on the right and let's say we have a point here which is closer to the red but it could be an anomaly but as a human we will say that it's a it's a red class which will be wrong but we, we, we can't help it all right so the next topic is linear classifier and as the name suggests uh, we'll have to draw linear lines and if it's a two-dimensional space it will be a line if it's three-dimensional it could be like a hyperplane uh, or you can say a surface a plane surface and again it could be a hyperplane if it's n-dimensional space so for this particular scenario what we will do is we'll just draw a linear line between these two and that linear line you know that you can just use uh, maybe two parameters for two-dimensional space and you can have the equation of this line which you can use to differentiate the testing samples now <clears throat> if you have let's say this scenario so the solid dots are class one and uh, the non-solid are uh, okay just the circles are the second class then we can draw a decision boundary like this which will be i think very effectively able to classify uh, these two classes now the question is why why this particular line we can have this line or this line all these are possible solutions right so so the question is which one of these lines is the best and that uh, that that answer will lead us to like the first linear classifier we are, we are going to uh, going to see that's called a maximum margin classifier but essentially any of these lines will work and at least for the training samples but the but the question is what will happen if we have a testing sample which which is kind of a, a slightly different from what you have seen in the training for example let's say i have a, a circle uh, a sample from the circle class and it can be around this point right because that's close to all these points close to this distribution and then what happens is all these lines which are like slanting towards the right they will fail right similarly if uh, i have a sample from this uh this a uh, filled circle let's say at this point which is which is uh, again true because it's closer to this distribution so it should belong to this class and again so this line will fail so it seems like we need some kind of balance which actually uh, differentiate between these points so let's see how we can uh, create that balance okay so if we if we if we draw a line the solid line the black one then if you draw like some kind of margin between that line to the closest point of each of these uh, classes for example this line if you consider all the uh, solid uh, solid circles this one is the closest all right and if this is the closest then this is the minimal distance i will have from the training sample to the decision boundary and that's the thickness of this orange this orange plot all right similarly what we will do is we will compute the distance of uh, this boundary from the closest sample from the other class and in this case this is the point and the vertical distance is like the the distance so we call that distance margin all right so now what we do is to to design an optimal decision boundary we try to maximize this margin because if we if we are maximizing the margin then we are actually creating some kind of bandwidth between the decision boundary and the closest training sam sample so the maximum that margin is the more robust your classifier will be and in this particular case particular case like this is the decision boundary which is kind of the most uh, optimal uh, which we can have and this is like the maximum margin which we can generate between the training samples of class one and class two right and the center of this uh, patch over here will be your decision boundary and you can see that mean you can't increase this margin more than this in whatever direction you try to uh, rotate your decision boundary so this is called a uh, maximum margin linear classifier so linear because it will be a linear it will be a straight line and maximum margin because you're trying to maximize the margin between margin between the samples of two different classes right 
So this is also like a simplest kind of uh, SVM, which we call like linear uh, support vector machine. Uh, we'll come to support vector, vector machine later on, which is like uh, more complex. So this is your first classifier and the points here, which are closest to uh, closest to the decision boundary, these are called support vectors. So in this case, we have three different support vectors because they are kind of on the boundary of uh, this margin. So one from first class and two from the second class. Okay. So this SVM, it, it came in uh, 1990s and there's like a very interesting story about this. So when it came, it was it was very powerful and it actually tried, it, it solved like all the problems where, wherever we need uh, to do classification. So it was very, very popular in nineties um, and in like, <clears throat> early 2000s. So in, in different domains, it, it provided very, very good results. So in parallel, researchers were also trying to develop neural networks. And in 90s, they were they were really a big deal. So I showed you like the earliest neural network that was, uh, I think, 70s, 68 or 67. And then it was kind of lukewarm. And then in 90s, uh, there was a boom. And a lot of researchers started uh, working on this neural networks. But then SVM came and then all the research like uh, for neural network, it, it just went down. No one was interested in that because the idea was interesting. The analogy to, to brain was interesting, but then in terms of results, it wasn't doing like a uh, magic, but SVM did that. So all the research was like then focused on SVMs, all the late nineties, early two thousands. And that and you can say that that was one of the reason why the boom, like which we have we are seeing today, the deep learning it was delayed because the SVMs were kind of saturated around that time. And some researchers still continued working on neural networks and they were able to like um, come up with a breakthrough in I think 2012. And after then, I mean, I will not say SVMs were out of phase, we still use SVMs. And I think in most of the companies, if we just have to solve a problem and you just need a classifier, people still use SVMs. So that's very robust. But if you have a lot of, lot of data, then I think, of course, you will, you will go with neural networks. Okay, so these are the three, I think, simple classifiers, which we'll talk about. We'll not talk about like uh, them in very detail, uh, but max margin we have already talked about and soon after support vector classifier, which is again based on the similar idea, but uh, with a slight change, we'll talk about that change. And then we'll talk about why we needed uh, support vector machines. Okay, so max margin again, we just need a hyperplane. And the example I showed you that was a 2D space. So 2D space, we just need a 1D line. But if it's 3D space, we need a hyperplane, which is a 2D plane. And again, if it's n-dimensional uh, data point, then we will need n minus one dimensional hyperplane. All right. So you can define a hyperplane using this uh, general equation. And this is a hyperplane uh, of lines if you want to distinguish between these two classes. And in this case, you just have two parameters, this beta one and beta two and this beta zero, which is kind of, a, you can say bias, bias term. And with just these three values, you can draw this decision boundary. Okay, so max margin classifier we saw, uh, that's good. Now the question is, I think there's a, a question from Momal, right? What if we have a outlier? And that was more focused towards testing data, but the question is, what if we have an outlier in the training data and how will the decision boundary be changed? And if you, if you are following me, then <clears throat> you can easily understand that if we have an outlier in your training data, that will shift your decision boundary significantly. Because let's say this point and this point are like the closest to each other uh, from two different classes. So these are the crucial points which are actually defining the decision boundary. But if these are outliers, then they are actually controlling the decision boundary, which is not true. So that's uh, why we need to take care of that. And it is uh, addressed in uh, the linear support vectors, right? Uh, linear vector classifiers. And in that case, what we do is we discount some of these points and we assume that they might be outliers. So when we are creating our decision boundary, we will say that, okay, these many points are allowed to cross that margin or cr cross that boundary. So we are kind of relaxed. 
So again, that's almost similar to max margin classifier, but that's slight change. Okay, so in this case, for example, this is max, max margin classifier. And if we have to build a support vector classifier, and we have a, let's say, discount of uh, two points, then what we will do is we might ignore, let's say, this point, then this margin will actually go until this one, the next point, which is over here. So your decision boundary is going to shift a lot. And then again, you can discount this point. Again, your boundary will shift, all right? So de depending upon what's the cost or how much, how many points you can discount, you can vary your margin. And again, that will lead to a different decision boundary. Okay, question from Amal. Outlier, here is a blue point in red region. Yeah, that's true. So that, that doesn't have to be a uh, red region, but again, so you're you're defining your region based on your training samples, right? Again, I mean that that that's not um, not always accurate. So if you're considering them as outlier, we will we will change the the, the coloring of your your space as well, right? It will it will shift. Uh, but we, no, professor, as in I had the confusion, uh, the points which are affecting the decision boundary. Uh, due to which we need to include this discount thing um, are the outliers and outliers in case of classification are uh, points from other class which are in a region where the points from the first class are in abundance Is that yeah that's yeah that's that's one scenario of outlier but the other oh. scenario could be it, it might not be crossing the boundary but it might be like close to the boundary right so that's that's another scenario and a third scenario could be uh, a blue point could be like somewhere here if you're following my uh, laser pointer so that's also an outlier but it's still in the blue region we just consider yeah, the, the points closer to the right if it's affecting the decision boundary that's critical right thank you and how to come up with the decision boundary it's simple it's a very simple optimization problem so you can have like your uh, observation. So these are your training samples and these are the labels. So negative one is like one class, positive one is the second class. And we just want to maximize this margin. And this margin is like the distance between the closest point, the closest point for, for, uh, for those two classes, right? And we do put some regularization on uh, these parameters, which are the coefficients of your decision boundary. So which is fine. And this equation over here, this is just uh, putting the criteria that your all your uh, training samples are classified correctly. So yi will be plus one for one class, negative one for the other class. And if this term is zero, which means that the point lie, lie like exactly on the point uh, on the line on the decision boundary. But if it's like towards one of the classes, you will either get positive number or negative number. So this is just a constraint which says that each of the training samples should be classified correctly. Okay. Now, as I said, uh, the SV, the uh, support vector classifier, we can have uh, some margin, but the, the problem is the, the data in real world, it's, it's never actually linear, okay? The decision boundary will never be linear. So in reality, you might get something like this. These are your purple points, class one, and then you have uh, second class blue points, second class blue points. So there is no way you can come up with a decision boundary which is linear and your classifier will perfectly. You cannot draw a boundary. You can try. So this is like what uh, optimizing that uh, <clears throat> maximum margin uh, classifier gave you. So this will be the decision boundary, but you can see that it's making a lot of mistakes. Okay, so that's the challenge. And I think that will be the next topic. We'll talk about how we can uh, address this, how we can have non-linear boundaries. And probably I think we'll cover that in the next lecture. So if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, let's let's end it here, right? I will see you next week, and then we'll talk about SVM support vector machine, and also talk about neural networks or CNNs. Uh, that's uh, I think.
mostly use uh, these days. But I think having a knowledge of these classifiers is, is also important. Question from Daniel, uh, max margin constraint optimization can be solved by linear programming. Yeah, you can use any optimization algorithm because you have the constraint there, right? So any optimization algorithm will work. Okay, all right, then uh, bye, see you, see you next week.